Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship at West Salem Christian Church. It has been a cold and a wintry week this past week. I hope that everybody uh, who's watching was able to stay safe and warm and, and uh, not have to travel too much on the, the dangerous roads. And I'm grateful that uh, spring is almost here, that the warm weather is right around the corner. And I'm glad to be together this morning, that we can gather in the warmth of fellowship as the body of Christ here in this place. So let's go into this time of worship to give God the praise and the honor and the glory that he is due.
Good morning. This is our prayer time. Would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 28 through 31. Again, that is the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to be reading verses 28 through 31. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth these words. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. Well, would you join me now as we go before our God, who saves us through Christ Jesus.
Heavenly Father, thank you for your great wisdom in providing salvation through the grace of Jesus. We worship you in awe and in thanksgiving for your merciful plan of salvation satisfies your holy, sinless nature, and it demonstrates your active love for sinful mankind. Our reconciliation is nothing that we can boast about, for Jesus Christ has become our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. He became our sin on that cross and took our deserved punishment, death. When he cried out, it is finished, the penalty for sin was paid in full. And his resurrection demonstrates that death is not final. And now we have before you in heaven an eternal mediator. When he returns as king and judge of the world, the victory over evil will be complete. We praise you, Father, for this victory, and we marvel that you chose us, the lowly and insignificant. We pray now that this message of salvation will begin to chip away at the arrogant and self-assured hearts until, through your spirit, they realize their true standing before you. May they fall in humble repentance and call upon your name. We pray for our brothers and sisters here in our church that they may continue to abide in Christ and resist Satan's constant attacks. May they continue in your word and in prayer for the sake of your kingdom and for your glory, Father. We also continue to lift up those who are dealing with health issues that they may be returned to health. We also pray for those who have lost loved ones that they may find comfort and strength. And Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with problems, problems that we may not know about, fears, concerns, and we ask that you would meet their needs at your timing. Most of all, Father, we know that we can rest in you for all the answers, and we do ask for continued patience in us as we wait upon your perfect timing. We thank you for this time of worship and fellowship, and we give thanks for Seth and his family and their ministry with us. We pray for the power and impact of your word today. Change the lives of Christians and the lost as it is preached. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray in agreement. Amen. Today, we're starting a new message series called Rooted Deep. Through this series, we're going to be covering some areas of our lives that have to do with our personal faith and practices. And the goal is going to be to help us to build a deeper faith, a faith rooted in Jesus and in his word, and a resilient faith that will see us through the storms of this life. God gives us a description of a person who is rooted in him through the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8 says, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. It, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So over the next few weeks, we'll be trying to build some habits and routines that will help us sink our roots down deeper into God's truth and be like those trees planted by the water who are always bearing fruit. But in order to do that, it's going to take some hard work because it means growing and maturing in our faith. In Colossians 1, 28 and 29, Paul makes it clear that his goal was to help people grow and mature in Jesus. He says, he, Christ, is the one who we proclaim admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy so Christ, powerfully work, or Christ so powerfully works in me. But growing and maturing can be uncomfortable and painful. It's always easier to just stay where we're at, but it's worth the hard work, and it's God's desire for us to mature and grow. 
So through this series, some of the things that we're going to talk about are going to require some harder and some deeper work, maybe, than what we might be used to. And we're starting with one of maybe the hardest and the least familiar things to us, but that can really deepen the roots of our faith. Today, we're going to be talking about fasting. Fasting isn't something that we hear much about these days, and it's not a very common practice in most churches or or in the lives of of most Christians. Here's the simplest definition I could come up with for biblical fasting. Fasting fasting is voluntarily giving up something physical for a deeper spiritual purpose. Now, while fasting can include giving up almost anything physical, every time we see fasting described in Scripture, it has to do with uh, abstaining from eating food. And even though fasting might be sort of an obscure idea to us, it's something that we see all through Scripture. And I want to say up front that there's no command that all followers of Jesus should fast. But it is something that Jesus encourages and even models for us. And what we see about fasting in Scripture is that fasting is personal, productive, and powerful. There are many times that fasting is done in a group or community setting, but often fasting is something that we see individuals doing. And when I say it's personal, I mean it's something that's between us and God. It's about our relationship with Him. Fasting is not like a a hunger strike or something to get attention from anybody else. In fact, in Matthew 6, 16 through 18, Jesus says this, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus tells us a whole lot right there. First, he says, when you fast, which implies that he's expecting his followers to be fasting. But he also tells us that fasting is something that God sees and something that God rewards. This is a powerful thing, fasting. And Jesus also warns us that we can easily waste that power and that reward if we fast to get attention from other people, if we act miserable or promote our fasting to make other people feel bad for us or to think better of us. We might get that attention, but that's all we're going to get. We'll be shortcutting that access to God that fasting gives us. But if fasting is such a personal and productive and powerful thing, well, when and how should we use it? Well, when we look at the Bible, there are a lot of opportunities that we see for fasting. So I want to quickly take a look at eight ways that fasting helps us deepen our roots in God. First, fasting helps us lean into God's leading. Paul tells us in Romans 12 that in order to test and approve God's will, we should offer our bodies as living sacrifices to him. And when we fast, we sacrifice a physical desire of our bodies in order to focus more on God. We also see in Acts chapter 14, when Paul and Barnabas are appointing elders to the churches in Syria, they do it with prayer and fasting. They wanted to make sure they had the right leaders for those churches. And so they they fasted to help with their decision and make sure they were in God's will. And we have decisions to make every day, obviously some bigger than others. What college to go to, whether or not to move to a new place or a new job, whether to marry someone or not, uh, what, what decisions to make regarding the health and care of our loved ones who might need us. And I would encourage you, especially in those big decisions, use a time of fasting to help you lean into God's leading. Next, fasting adds passion to our prayers. Of course, prayers are effective and powerful anytime, but fasting and praying together can take our prayers deeper. In the book of Nehemiah, he gets word that the walls of Jerusalem are destroyed and the gates have been burned. He's heartbroken and he has this deep burning desire to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah 1 verse 4, it says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah was faced with a huge challenge, but through his fasting and his prayer, God blessed Nehemiah's wishes, and he was able to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. And some of us are faced with huge challenges right now. Financial challenges, health challenges, relationship challenges, work challenges, school challenges, whatever it may be, we should seek God through those challenges. And when we incorporate fasting, into our prayers, 
it can focus our prayers and add passion to them. And some of those challenges that we face can be painful and emotional. And fasting can help us in those moments too, because fasting guides us in our grieving. In Judges chapter 20, the Israelite army is going into battle against the Benjamites. They, they prayed to God and he told them to go up and to face their enemies. But over two days, the Israelite army has lost 40,000 men. And then in Judges 20, verse 26, it says, Then all the Israelites, the whole army, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. They had been following God's leading. They had been doing what he said to do, and they were still literally getting massacred. They could have been angry. They could have blamed God and rejected him in their mourning and their sadness, but instead they offer sacrifices and they fast and they seek God in their sadness and their lament. And God, God encourages them and, and the next day God gives them victory. And there's a lot of times for us to grieve in life, times when we're, we struggle with loss, loss of a marriage or other relationship, loss of a loved one or a job, loss of a dream, loss of a friendship, and it's perfectly fine to grieve those losses. Sometimes we feel like we have to just get over things and act happy if we're going to be trusting God, but grief and lament has always been a part of the life of God's people. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells us that we do not grieve like the rest of humanity who does not have hope. We have a true and living God to turn to. We have a living Savior who has felt grief and loss, and we can turn to him for comfort and peace in our grief. So if you're seeking God in a time of grief right now, maybe you should consider incorporating fasting into your prayers. Because even in times of grief or uncertainty, fasting points us to our protector. There are all sorts of times where we feel unsure and alone. And in those times, we need assurance that we're not alone and that we have a God who is our strength and is our shield. And in the book of Esther, God's people are at risk of being murdered because of the plan of an evil man named Haman. Esther is part of the king's harem and, and she has a unique opportunity to speak up and to protect her people, but she knows that if she goes into the king's presence without being summoned there, she could be put to death. But if she doesn't go, she knows that most of her people, including maybe herself, will die. She's in a tough situation. But here's what she tells her uncle, Mordecai, in Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and, I, and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. She knows that her life and the life of her people are on the line. She also understands that the only chance that she has is to trust that God will see her through this. So if you're feeling unsure and alone, you might want to try fasting as a way to help point you toward your protector. And in order to trust God as our protector, it takes humility. And fasting can help us with that too, because fasting heightens our humility before God. Fasting can allow us to trust him more, to trust him to be the one who fights our battles, to trust him to be the one who defends us and gives us justice, to trust him enough to take ourselves out of the way. In Psalm 35, David pleads with God to defend him. He says he has people who contend with him and fight against him. He says he has people who pursue him and seek his life and plot his ruin and tell lies about him. And David pleads with God to defend him against these enemies and in verse 12 through 14 of Psalm 35, David says this, They repay me evil for good and leave me like one bereaved. Yet when they were ill, I put on sackcloth and humbled myself with fasting. When my prayers returned to me unanswered, I went about mourning as though for my friend or brother. David asks God to return to his enemies what they have done to him. But David doesn't say, I'm going to go out and get my own revenge. Even though these men have done evil things to him, he responds humbly. And in his humility, he's able to leave the battle to God and trust him to do what is right. And humility is a big part of the next thing that fasting can do for us too. And that is fasting reinforces our repentance. True repentance, admitting our sins and failures and choosing to turn from those things is a huge act of humility. 
Fasting is a humbling thing too. That's an act of admission that it's not food or physical things that can sustain us, but God alone. And fasting in repentance demonstrates our understanding that we cannot atone for our own sins, but that forgiveness comes from God alone through Jesus. In the book of Jonah, we see an example of this kind of repentance. God has told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh, preach against their wickedness. And Jonah doesn't like the idea of confronting his enemies about their sin in the middle of their own capital city. And so he tries to run. But God causes a storm to come up and has him swallowed by a huge fish that spits him back out where God wants him to be. So Jonah reluctantly obeys God, goes to the center of the city and tells them that they need to repent. And when that message of Jonah reaches the king, here is the response that we see. Jonah 3, 7 through 9 says, This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. This is a serious response. They even include their animals in this fast of repentance. And this was a demonstration of repentance that God honored. It says that when God saw what they did, not what they said, what they did, he then relented and forgave them. So maybe you've been holding on to something in your life that you haven't wanted to to give up some secret, some sin, maybe an addiction or a temptation that you've not fully surrendered to God. Something that you need to humble yourself and repent from. And if that's true, and, and you've struggled to do that in the past, let me suggest that maybe you try fasting along with your repentance. Because fasting strengthens our stand against temptation. We might think that fasting from food would make us weak, and it can make us physically weak, but the process of fasting can make us stronger in some much more important ways. In the fourth chapter of both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, we read about what happened directly following the baptism of Jesus. It says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness where he fasted and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights. Now that is an extreme fast, eating nothing, for 40 days would definitely affect you physically. And in both Matthew and Luke, it says that after fasting that long, he was hungry. But it doesn't say he was weak. Satan comes and tempts him with three things, and Jesus answers each of those three temptations with the word of God. Jesus may have been physically hungry, but spiritually, he was filled. He was in full control of his body, his desires, and his mind. He he had been relying on God alone, not physical provision, for over a month. And he was strengthened to face the temptations of Satan. In Luke's account of this event, in verse 13, it says, When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Which implies that this was maybe not an opportune time. Jesus had used his time of fasting to strengthen himself to stand against temptation. And after Jesus had fasted and prayed and faced these temptations, he began his ministry and he started calling his first disciples. And fasting can do the same for us. Fasting motivates us to ministry. Each of us has talents and abilities and gifts and resources and unique skill set and sphere of influence that allow us to minister in unique ways inside and outside of the church. And when we fast, when we make it less about ourselves and more about God's will, when we limit ourselves and follow his leading, he will lead us into serving and loving others. In Isaiah 58, 5 through 7, God is describing the type of fasting that his people have been doing, but then describes what he wants them to do. It says, Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the kind of fast I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with, your, with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. 
The kind of fasting that God desires is a selfless, humble, repentant fasting that leads us to depend on him more and causes us to think about the needs and the well-being of others. So I want to invite each of you to participate in fasting. And I want to say first, if you're a diabetic or have some other health issue that would make fasting dangerous, please do not do anything that would put you at risk. But I want to encourage you, if you're able, to participate in two different kinds of fasting. First, sometime this next week, choose a time to fast from eating food. If you can take an entire day, great. If you feel like you can just fast from one meal or two meals, do that. Again, this is a spiritual tool, not a command. Jesus is not going to be upset with you if you don't fast. But if you can try fasting for a day from food, and and when you feel those hunger urges, use that as a reminder to pray and to seek God. And the second thing I would encourage you to do is to fast from one thing for the next, next six weeks, from now until Easter. I'm not asking you to not eat for six weeks, but just to abstain from something. Maybe you'll choose to abstain from eating chocolate, or maybe uh, you'll give up coffee or caffeine. Uh, Maybe you want to choose to give up smoking or alcohol, or some of you might uh, choose to fast from social media or television. Whatever it is, it's up to you, but uh, while you're fasting from that thing for the next six weeks, when you feel the discomfort of that thing missing in your life, I want to encourage you to think of these biblical examples that we saw today. Let this fasting help you lean into God's leading, add passion to your prayers, guide you in your grieving, point you to your protector. Let it heighten your humility before God and reinforce your repentance and strengthen your stand against temptation. And finally, seek God's guidance on where he wants to motivate you to ministry. Look for how he wants to use you to minister to your family, your friends, and your community. And I would also ask that as you fast, please pray for the ministry and the outreach of this church as we move toward Easter. Pray that each of us would have the opportunity to invite someone to church on Easter. Pray that that opportunities to talk about and and share our faith would, would arise. Pray that God would use each of us as a part of this body to impact our community with the good news of the gospel this Easter. So let's choose to take a time of fasting to make it less about us and more about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to choose to take ourselves back a step and to to make a little more room for you. It's not easy to deprive ourselves of things, and it's countercultural in this world today. We'll be told over and over again that we should have every one of our needs met immediately, and not even just our needs, but our desires. But we know in your kingdom, your desire, your will is what's best. So we ask that you would empower us and strengthen us to be able to to take a step of faith and to, to choose some kind of fasting so that we can seek you more and that you would honor those efforts and you would speak to us and you would lead us and, and you would help us to grow and to mature in our faith and in our relationship with you and with your son. Thank you for your love and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
At the Passover meal, Jesus initiated the new covenant, which would soon be sealed by his death on the cross. In chapter 11 of his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul reminded believers that whenever they ate the bread and drank the cup, they were proclaiming Jesus' death until he returns. He also warned them to examine themselves carefully. For to eat and drink in an unworthy manner would be sinful. We today must be very, very mindful of that. Jesus Christ's death on the cross means that sin's horrible cost has been paid in full for as long as this world exists. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, just before he died, he was declaring that sin's power was broken and Satan's head was crushed. His resurrection declared the death penalty for sin was now null and void. As John so eloquently wrote, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Mankind has a decision to make, either to humbly accept his gift by faith or to arrogantly reject it. In this moment, let us reflect on what Jesus means to us as we also examine ourselves before God. We take now the bread and remember. And drink from the cup as we remember. Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit can convict us and will convict us of our sin, both willful and, and sins that are committed without realizing it. But Lord, we are sinful and we acknowledge that and we pray that you will bring that before us so that we may eat at your table rightly. And Father, most of all, we give thanks for your son. His sacrifice and his resurrection mean everything to us. We pray that we will remember this, not only in this moment, but daily, moment by moment, that he is our source, our salvation, our strength. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we continue worshiping God through our giving, let's look together at three scriptures which remind us that giving is a measure of one's love for God. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, we read, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Just like a weather vane, this scripture shows us which direction the winds of our hearts are leaning. How are we measuring up? Now consider these words by Paul to Timothy, found in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 18. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. You know, when we consider the income that's available to the over 7 billion individuals on earth today, we can discover with just a little bit of research that all of us in this room, regardless of our situations, are really rich in this present world. How are we measuring up? And finally, John digs right into our spiritual bone marrow with this sharp inquiry. In 1 John 3.17, we read, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? I find myself confronted by the scripture in the same way that the rich young ruler was confronted by Jesus' request to deal with the one thing he lacked. I know that my heart does not measure up very well in any of these categories. Yet in the midst of this deep scalpel incision of biblical truth, there is joy and hope that are sure to come in the verses that follow. After the story of the rich young ruler ends, the disciples, having considered all Jesus' summations regarding the rich and their salvation, were overcome with hopelessness as they asked, who then can be saved? Can you hear the hope in Jesus' response? What is impossible with man is possible with God. Praise God for his mercy in the face of all of our sin and weakness, and give today with joy to the God that makes all things possible, things that we cannot do. Thank you again for being a part of this time of worship. I want to encourage you to, uh, to just do what you are able to and what you're comfortable with and what is uh, appropriate for you and your uh, relationship with Jesus at the moment and with your, your health and your personal situation. Just to, uh, to try to step into the world of fasting a little bit, to, to limit ourselves, to make a little bit more room for Jesus and, uh, and to seek God and his will in our lives. It, it can be an exciting thing to do. Let's pray as we uh, get ready to sing our closing song. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you that you hear us always, that you are but a breath away, that, that you hear our prayers, that you know what's going on in our life, that, that it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't require fasting or, or earning anything for us. But we know that sometimes practices like fasting can help and can, can uh, take us a little deeper in our prayer life and, and in our relationship with you. So we ask that as we make attempts in that area, that you would honor that. We know that you, you see our efforts and that you, you value our attempts to, uh, to be faithful to you. So we pray that you would uh, just uh, empower us through our time of fasting and, and help us to grow and to see uh, what you can do as we surrender to you more and more each day. We love you and we trust you and we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Love is a strong and mighty fortress. Raise your 